Good Monday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, round two. This morning, the second public hearing for the January 6th House Committee. The panel will focus on how the deadly attack at the Capitol was not a spontaneous riot, but actually a result of misinformation from former President Trump. This man had the microphone. He could speak to the whole country. His duty was to stand up and say something and try to stop this. The key witnesses who will testify this morning and the evidence that could come out during this week's hearings. Breakthrough, a bipartisan deal that could lead to the most significant changes to gun laws in decades. This comes after a weekend of protests across the country calling on Congress to act. We'll break down what's in this deal and what got left out. Priced out the national average for gas now at $5 a gallon. Add that to the record inflation of just about everything else, and it's causing people to make major lifestyle changes. The steps families are taking just to stay afloat. And Zoom Town Boom. Remote workers are changing where they take those video calls by moving out of big cities and into smaller rural areas. We'll take you to Montana in one of the fastest growing regions in the country to show you how people there are trying to adapt. Doesn't quite work for us, but it's cool. No. Well, we could set up a studio in Bozeman. That's you never true. know. Yeah, that's true. I guess we were for a while all yeah. from home, but yeah, it's nice that we're together. Exactly. <laughs> Happy Monday to you all at home. Thanks for joining us. We begin with the latest on the investigation into the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Later this morning, the House Committee investigating the attack will hold its second public hearing. Three hearings are taking place this week. According to Committee Chair Benny Thompson, today's will focus on former President Donald Trump's so-called big lie among the panel of witnesses will be Trump's former campaign manager, Bill Stepien, who was forced to testify by subpoena last November. The committee said Stepien supervised the conversion of the 2020 campaign operation into a disinformation campaign to overturn the election. For more, let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa. Ali, good morning to you. So that first hearing in prime time last week saw some explosive testimony. Can we expect more of that this morning? And also, when it comes to Stepien, in addition to him, who else are we going to hear from? Yeah, Joe, the committee is promising another day of revelations with never before seen video, as well as that witness testimony from, as you mentioned, Bill Stepien, but also former Fox News political editor Chris Steyerwalt. He was at the center of really a fallout after the election uh, by the network's top brass, the former president himself, Trump supporters, after he defended the network's decision uh, to be the first network to call the state of Arizona for then candidate Biden. That was really the first sign uh, that Trump was going to lose his re-election bid. Uh, so there's a lot of information that Chris Steyerwalt could offer as to the role of the media in, in the period between the election and January 6th, Joe. So, Ali, as we mentioned, this morning's hearing is expected to focus on what's known as the big lie, with the panel saying that the deadly attack on the Capitol was not a spontaneous riot, but rather the direct result of the former president's bad faith information campaign. How is the committee going to try and make that argument today through those who are testifying? So the committee held sort of a background call with reporters yesterday, and they said that it'll dig deeper into how Trump, quote, declared victory on an election that he lost, spread claims of fraud, and then decided to ignore the rulings of the courts when the judgment of the courts didn't go his way. For Bill Stepien, for instance, this is someone who had unfettered access to the president, uh, who was extremely familiar, obviously, with his thinking, spending so much time with him. Uh, and he would be able to testify as to really what Trump knew and when he knew it. Uh, maybe he was one of the people within uh, former President Trump's inner circle who was one of the people who told him that he lost the election, or perhaps he believed uh, the big lie, like the former president. Uh, he could be a wealth of knowledge about former President Trump's thinking, possibly on January 6th as well, and the weeks after. Um, for Chris Steyerwalt specifically, uh, they want to know really how much he knew and, and, and really what the media's role in, in spreading this was. Uh, I believe we have uh, a quote for you here. Um, the committee told reporters that in this hearing for Chris Steyerwalt, it'll talk about the political fundraising that was done between the election and January 6th. Chris Steyerwald will be the one that could uh, shed some light on that, Joe. All right, Allie. And the committee is, is making its presentation not only to the American people, but really also to the Department of Justice, which ultimately has the power to decide whether to indict the former president. What's the committee saying about its findings there? 
So committee members are saying that they're not only making their case to the American people, they're also making a case to the Justice Department for what they say is valid evidence that Trump committed crimes here. Uh, several of them spoke on the Sunday shows yesterday. I believe we have a, a soundbite from committee member Adam Schiff. Once the evidence is accumulated by the Justice Department, it needs to make a decision about whether it can prove to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt the president's guilt or anyone else's. Uh, but they need to be investigated uh, if there's credible evidence, which I think there is. The big question now is attorney is is whether Attorney General Merrick Garland is listening and how soon after these hearings will he be willing to act on all this? All right, Ali Rafa, thanks so much for kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. All right, so let's stay on that topic right there. And as we get started with this another day of testimony into the attack, there's a new renewed debate as to whether the January 6th committee has compiled enough evidence for the Department of Justice to pursue a criminal indictment against the former president. Joining us now for more on that point is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas. Danny, good morning. Always great to have you with us. So walk us through what we know so far in terms of the case being presented against former President Trump, whether there is enough for the Justice Department to really pursue a criminal indictment here. How does this work? What's next? Yeah, first of all, who's in the debate arguing that there isn't enough evidence compiled? I mean, certainly in terms of collecting evidence, mm. this committee has collected a lot of evidence, terabytes of data, documents, recordings, testimony. Yes, they've been thwarted on testimony by some, but they have gotten testimony from many others. The real question is, do they have enough evidence to, as one member promised, blow the top off the Capitol mm -hmm. when the evidence comes out? Or is it evidence that we've mostly already heard? So what people are going to be looking for in terms of what they produce in terms of evidence is whether or not Trump was made aware, and that's magic language, because beyond being aware that he had lost the election, did he understand it? Did he get it? Did he believe it? it it's a balancing test. Do you believe all the reliable people who told you you, lo you lost, or do you have a right to believe someone like a Giuliani who comes in and says, no, 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 you won, keep fighting? And that's really what this is going to come down to. Yes, mm. this is an audience of the American people, but it's also an audience of one. And that one is Merrick Garland. Mm -hmm. And he has a difficult decision in the coming weeks and months after this, this presentation. Mm -hmm. Lots of that he is going to have to balance and consider. Let's take a listen to, to something else that Congressman Adam Schiff, who's on the committee, said about the potential for criminal charges. I would like to see the Justice Department investigate any credible allegation of criminal activity on the part of Donald Trump or anyone else. Uh, the rule of law needs to apply equally to everyone. Uh, and there are uh, certain uh, actions, parts of these different lines of effort to overturn the election that uh, I don't see evidence the Justice Department is investigating. So if the committee did recommend a criminal indictment against Trump, then what are the next steps? What happens? The short answer to that is whatever the DOJ wants to do, because the committee can recommend all it likes, but ultimately that is the DOJ's independent decision. It is Merrick Garland's independent decision. And it's a tough one because it's very easy for a committee to announce that, hey, there's enough for a criminal invest or excuse me, a criminal prosecution. But it's an entirely different thing for Merrick Garland or a U.S. attorney to stake their reputation, their careers on a prosecution of a former president. So ultimately, this is Merrick Garland's independent decision at the DOJ, which is the way our system is designed, that mm. the DOJ is supposed to act independently. All right, Danny Savalos, what would we do without you? Thanks for being here this morning, as always. And you can watch the second hearing later this morning right here on NBC News Now. Our live coverage gets underway at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Now, in addition to that second January 6th hearing today, there's another major headline on Capitol Hill this morning, an agreement to legislation to combat gun violence in this country, including enhanced background checks on gun buyers. Democrat Chris Murphy of Connecticut and Republican John, John Cornyn of Texas were the chief negotiators in pulling together this breakthrough deal. We should note it's just a framework. A final bill has not yet been written. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman, who joins us from Washington. Josh, good morning to you. So talk to us about this gun reform deal that was announced yesterday. Yesterday, we know it's been in the works for a few weeks following the elementary school tragedy in Texas. What's in it? What's not in it? And what's the reaction? 
Well, what's not in it is an assault weapons ban or even raising the minimum age to buy uh, an assault weapon. Those are uh, among the more far-reaching proposals that Democrats would like to see had included, uh, of course, in that House passed bill uh, last week. But uh, Democrats are making sure that they do not let the, enemy, the perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to this legislation. The centerpiece uh, of this bill now in the process of being drafted uh, is these new background checks for people who are 18 to 21, which is really the target group uh, that these lawmakers wanted to focus on, given their role in so many uh, of these mass shootings. Senator Chris Murphy, the leading Democrat negotiator, uh, describing it as a pause. And essentially, uh, what this will do is create an opportunity before a young person can get their hands on a weapon uh, for additional checks that now will include calls to the local police department, to other local authorities to see, hey, is anyone reporting? anything strange with this individual. Uh, Senator Murphy was just on uh, MSNBC saying he thinks a provision like that could have specifically potentially prevented some of the mass shootings that we've seen in Texas uh, and in Buffalo. Uh, other provisions that are really top of mind from this bill uh, address those red flag laws that states can use uh, on which courts can deny people who have been deemed uh, a risk to themselves or others uh, the ability for a short time to possess a gun. They are also closing the boyfriend loophole uh, through this package, which will make sure that more domestic abusers aren't able to get their hands on guns. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer praising this agreement and saying this. I am particularly, particularly pleased that for the first time in close to 30 years, Congress seems ready to reject the vice-like grip that the NRA has had on the Congress and move forward to meaningful gun legislation. Once the text is finalized, I will put this bill on the floor ASAP as soon as possible so that Congress can quickly act. And so even though this falls far short of what most gun violence activists uh, and gun uh, 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 control activists uh, are saying is needed, uh, Democrats hoping that this will at least create more political space for Republicans to know that they can uh, support some gun restrictions without facing the kind of political consequences that has made this kind of progress so difficult in the past. So quickly, Josh, what happens next? Well, according to the Democrats who have been negotiating this, they want to uh, put the bill into a written form this week, and they hope for a Senate vote uh, within the next two weeks with the goal of getting this bill passed through Congress and on President Biden's desk to sign by the end of July or at the very latest, the beginning of August before lawmakers go home for their August recess show. Josh Letterman in Washington. Thank you, Josh. Now, before that deal was announced, demonstrators took to the streets in hundreds of cities on Saturday, pushing for more serious gun control reform. It comes from people in Uvalde, Texas. It comes as people in Uvalde, Texas, try to pick up the pieces nearly three weeks after the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary School. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton joins us now from Uvalde. Hey, Antonia, thanks for being with us this morning. So what's the reaction been like there at this point to the news of this possible gun deal? Good morning, Savannah. Yesterday, as I was right here on the memorial grounds in Town Square, people were learning about this bipartisan deal. And it was met with unanimous praise. People were overwhelmingly happy to hear about this. But at the same time, you know, there was a bit of hesitation from folks. And I think that that cynicism, that hesitation, stems from the level of hurt and anger here. People are still reeling over the death of 19 children and two beloved teachers here. And, you know, the reality is no matter what these lawmakers do, nothing's going to bring those 19 babies back. It's not going to make these families whole again. And so for some folks here, you know, they didn't want to pat lawmakers too much on the back. They didn't want to give them too much credit. Take a listen to some of the conversations that I had right here at the memorial site yesterday. Are you encouraged that lawmakers are actually trying to do something? I am, but who knows, you know, they can always say all these things, but if it really passes, you know, that's a different, you know. But I'm glad that, you know, if they'll come together into a consensus to do something, then that's, yeah. We'd love to see it. <laughs> well, I think they should pass it and uh, do the, I mean, strict laws, because the, the, the person that's going to follow the rules is going to get the gun. They're going to get whatever they like, and, and they're going to follow the rules. 
I spoke to people who were military, who were gun owners, and there seemed to be a unanimous agreement that better background checks were necessary, that an 18-year-old like the gunman here shouldn't be able to get their hands on something like an AR-15. Mm. And so, you know, again, there's a recognition that this is a deal. It's not a bill yet even. And so people were a bit hesitant to celebrate too much, uh, but they're happy to hear something's finally going to be done. But at the same time, they feel like this could have been done, this could have happened after any other number of tragedies here in the United States. Why did, you know, you ha we have to lose 21 lives here in Uvalde, Savannah? Absolutely. Antonia, now there have actually been 254 mass shootings this year alone. That's according to the Gun Violence Prevention, uh, Gun Violence Archive. We focus on all the lives lost, of course, but there are so many more lives that are changed forever. What are people there in Uvalde saying about the effect the shooting has had on them? People are reeling. I was here as a young child was being, you know, laid to rest just mm. about a block and a half away from where I am right now this weekend. And I, at the same time, was interviewing an eight-year-old here who was bursting into tears, saying that, you know, she is afraid. She is, you know, of course, mourning these kids. She lives close by to Uvalde. She doesn't go to Rob Elementary or the school system here but it was affecting her. And I thought that, that uh, my conversation with that eight-year-old really reflected how this is affecting kids all over Texas, kids all over the United States. And so there is this sense here that there has been immense loss, that perhaps these changes are coming too late. And here in town, from the residents and the victims' families, there's still this desire to see accountability, to see someone come forward and take responsibility for what happened to the children. Of course, as we've talked about all the new reporting coming out of the New York Times and Texas Tribune about the actions of the police chief here, that's on the mind of a lot of folks. And so there is mourning, you know, there's gratefulness for this federal action, but there is a desire to see results and accountability at the local level. Take a listen to a conversation that I had with one child and their father here yesterday. Does this change the way you feel about school? Yes. Definitely. Now I'm still kind of scared to go to school. I'm sorry. How do you talk about it as a family? You have to, because it can happen anywhere. So you have to Be give aware. them the knowledge so that they understand in a situation you never know. You gotta react. A lot of the families here want to see the school's chief of police, Pete Arredondo, held responsible. And for them, part of the healing process is that accountability. It is someone coming forward, taking responsibility for what happened here at the school district. So it's really got to be those two pieces, action from lawmakers and leaders, but accountability and someone stepping forward and saying that they're sorry to these families. Savannah. Antonia Hilton, thank you so much. For the first time ever, the nationwide average price for a gallon of gas broke the $5 barrier. Now, one gas station owner in Massachusetts says he's fed up. He gets his gas supply from ExxonMobil and says he's shutting off the pumps at his gas station in Amherst because he feels customers should not have to pay these astronomically high prices to fuel up. When they said go up 20 cents one day and 20 cents the next morning, that's 40 cents in two days. I knew it was a ripoff. They won't stop. They're number one in the country, and they'll always be because there is no conscience. And I have one. Let's look at the numbers. AAA says the national average sits at just over $5 a gallon. That's up 14 cents from last week and up nearly $2 from the national average this time last year. Caleb Silver, editor-in-chief at Investopedia, joins us now. So, Caleb, ExxonMobil told a local newspaper that the price at the pump is out of the company's control and is based on several factors, including the price of crude. So is there anything oil companies can do to try and help stabilize rising fuel costs? Well, they love these high, high prices. Anything over $50 a barrel, Joe, is pure profit for oil companies. And oil companies have spent years struggling with profit margins because the price of oil was low. They're enjoying this bull market in commodities and especially oil. In terms of price rigging, not the, there's nothing they're going to do. They're publicly traded companies. They're responsible to their shareholders. They're out there to make a profit. Let's not kid ourselves about this. Can they put more supply into the market? They can't. 
OPEC. OPEC plus controls the cartel and most of the price of the supply of oil. The U.S. produces a lot of oil as well, and so does China. We're just not taking a lot of Chinese imports. So there's not a lot the oil companies can or will do about this because this is high times for oil and gas companies. And let's talk more about the supply. I mean, we know one of the reasons we're seeing these record high prices is because of bottlenecks at U.S. refineries, which are still reeling from the impacts of the pandemic. Now they're struggling with this increase in demand for gas. Can you explain what's going on here and what is the best thing that we could do or could be done to try and help increase the oil supply? Right. Well, refineries, many of them had to shut down or shut down because of the pandemic. They didn't have enough workers. There wasn't enough demand. So shutting down a refinery takes a few days. Turning one back on takes several months and a lot of capital. So they're loath to do that because they don't know if demand is going to persist at these levels. So I wouldn't count on them ca uh, ratcheting up refinery output anytime soon. Plus, a lot of these oil and gas companies were in the middle of a transition to cleaner energy sources and producing cleaner energy sources. So taking a few billion dollars or a hundred million dollars to get a refinery back up or start a new refinery is not palatable for them or their shareholders. Is there anything we can do in the U.S. to add more supply? Yeah, we've already added a billion, a million barrels a day from the strategic petroleum reserves. But Joe, we use 20 million barrels a day here in the U.S. So a million barrels into a 20 million a day use isn't that much. Can we reduce gas taxes nationally? Yes, we can. That's about 16 cents across the country. Several states have already done that. That'll reduce the burden on drivers who have to fill up at the gas station. But there's not a lot we can do here because of the supply issues and the demand issues on the other side. All right. Caleb, thank you so much for joining us. As always, we appreciate your expertise. And now let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Michelle Grossman is with us. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. And we are watching dangerous heat this week. Uh, historical heat, really. We're looking at 90s, 100s. It's going to feel like 115 in some spots. Also watching the chance for some severe weather. So first, we'll start with the heat because we're looking at records likely to be broken. We could see 100 records broken over the next few days. So 54 million people impacted. You can see how many alerts we have in place from a heat advisory, a heat watch, to excessive heat warning. That is in the hot pink. And that's what we're going to be watching over the next several days. From the southwest to the upper Midwest, the Ohio Valley, even into the uh, Carolinas, we're looking at triple digit heat. So sweltering heat continues that jet stream so far to the north, it's sort of opening the door to this summer like air. Heat index values, that's what it feels like to your body. They're going to climb as high as 110 to 115. So it's going to be dangerous over the next few days. You want to take breaks, you want to stay indoors when you can. And if you can't, then you want to find some shade. So the next three days, 100 plus records in 25 states. Each uh, dot here on the map kind of indicates where we think a record could be broken. So as we go throughout the day, we're looking at many spots that are too hot. We're looking at temperatures into the 100s, even as far north as Omaha. 100 degrees today. The record is 101 there. Uh, Nashville, 98 degrees, 106 in El Paso, 99 today in Houston, and 98 in Raleigh. We'll do it again tomorrow. We're going to do it again on Wednesday, too, in some spots. So by tomorrow, temperatures into the upper 90s. Minneapolis, 98 degrees. The record there is 98, 99 in Louisville, 96 in Memphis, Charleston, 98 degrees, and Charlottesville, we're looking at 93 degrees. We're going to keep it warm, not quite as warm through the end of the week, but still temperatures uh, well above normal for this time of year. Now, this heat could spark some storms later on this afternoon, 43 million people at risk. We're going to see really gusty winds, winds gusting to 75 miles per hour, damaging hail. A few tornadoes are possible, too. Likely where you see that yellow shading, so La Crosse to Milwaukee, Chicago, Columbus, into the interior parts of the Northeast, so Pittsburgh, you could see some storms as well. And again, it's going to be the wind damage that's going to be the most likely problems. Then tomorrow, we're looking at that threat moving into the Carolinas, 8 million at risk, with winds gusting to 60 miles per hour, damaging hail again, and also a isolated chance for a tornado, especially uh, along the Carolinas, Norfolk, Raleigh, into Wilmington. We could see some of that severe weather tomorrow. We could see some likely uh, localized flooding as well, up to three inches in some spots, especially where you see those darker colors, the yellows, the reds, the oranges. We could see some flash flooding. So just be careful as you head out today, also tomorrow, where you see those downpours. We're all looking at the flood threat also in the northwest is a combination of some snow melt and also some rainfall that could bring uh, some flooding conditions to the northwest. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Coming up on Morning News Now, Russia is on the verge of taking a major city in eastern Ukraine this morning. Yeah, the latest on the intense fighting in the Donbas region, plus the new war crimes accusations against the Russians. That's next.
Welcome back. Now let's get to the war in Ukraine. Russian forces now control 70 percent of the embattled eastern Ukrainian city of Severodonetsk, according to the governor of Luhansk. The key Donbass region is coming under heavy shelling amid fierce street battles. The region's governor said the city is close to being cut off from the rest of the country after a second bridge was destroyed, with the third and final bridge coming under intense bombing. Joining us now with more on this is Michael O'Hanlon. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Michael, thanks for being with us. Good to have you. So what's your assessment of what we're seeing in this particular city right now and the tactics being used by Russian forces to try to capture that city? Good morning, Savannah. I think, unfortunately, this is now typical of the fight in the east. And unfortunately, as well, it is going Russia's way. It's gradual. It's not... Uh, necessarily going to lead to huge territorial changes anytime soon, if ever. But it sort of almost evokes World War I. You know, it's primarily artillery based. As you point out, they're demolishing cities. They're going after entire neighborhoods. Very little precision in these attacks. Very little maneuver warfare. Uh, mm -hmm. Just really a hard fight and a very bloody one with, uh, as I'm sure you've seen, estimates of 100 or more soldiers dying each day on each side and uh, no end in sight. Yeah. Michael, I want to ask you about this new report from Amnesty International accusing Russia of committing war crimes in Kharkiv. The rights group says hundreds of civilians there have been killed by, quote, indiscriminate Russian shelling using widely banned cluster munitions and inherently inaccurate rockets. What do you make of those findings? And is it likely that we'll see any meaningful accountability for those actions here? I mean, especially when it kind of just is stacked on top of a lot of other war crimes in many other cities across this country. Right. I think on your second question, the answer is no. I can't see any realistic way to prosecute these war crimes, although it's still important to document them. On the first question, this is essentially the, the set of Russian tactics that we're observing. I mean, they're doing this on purpose. This is not units, you know, sometimes going beyond their orders or, uh, you know, uh, out of control unit leaders who are somehow seeking retaliation, although I'm sure there's some of that, too. But this is the way Russia is fighting the war. They are bombarding entire neighborhoods to demolish buildings and kill people within because they think that that's the site from which 10 people are shooting at them. So they demolish a building that has 100 people inside of it rather than try to fight person by person. This is almost an inevitable consequence of the fact that this war is happening at all. So while it's tragic what's happening tactically, the, the tactics follow from Putin's decision to invade and try to conquer this country with a military that can't really do effective maneuver warfare and is left with only these choices. So the tragedy is really baked into the operation. Right. It's a broader thing. That's a good point. I want to ask you now about another report. This is out by a leading think tank, Stop, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. It expects global nuclear arsenals to grow in the coming years for the first time since the Cold War. And it says, quote, the risk of nuclear weapons being used seems higher now than at any time since the height of the Cold War. What do you make of that assessment? It's possible they're right, although uh, I think that chances are still substantially lower than they were, let's say, in the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Berlin Crisis. But I think that what's, see, what's going on now is that Russian and American and French and British forces are essentially plateaued. They're not getting any smaller or bigger. Mm -hmm. But North Korea's arsenal continues to grow by probably 6 to 10, 12 bombs a year. So does Pakistan's. And you add those two in, and so you've got some overall upward movement. And now China, as you're aware, has announced that it's going to try to get up closer to 1,000 nuclear warheads, maybe 1,000 long-range warheads by the end of the decade from its current level, more like 300. And so you add that part in as well. And yes, you're seeing probably a net growth of at least several dozen warheads per year globally. It's not an astronomical growth compared to the kind of numbers we saw in the Cold War. But of the countries that are changing the size of their arsenals, three of them in particular are increasing and nobody's really cutting. All right, Michael O'Hanlon, as always, thanks for joining us and for your expertise this morning. Let's Thank get to you. some other international headlines now. We're going to start in Brazil, where search teams have found items belonging to a journalist and an indigenous expert who went missing in the Amazon rainforest a week ago. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey-Ferrer joins us from Beijing with that and more. Hey, Janice.
Hey, good morning. A troubling development in that search for two men who have been missing in a remote Amazon rainforest. Personal items belonging to British journalist Dom Phillips and Indigenous expert Bruno Pereira have been recovered, including boots, clothing, a flip-flop, and a health ID card. Now, relatives of Mr. Phillips have posted a message to Instagram saying they presume the two men are dead. Brazilian police last week arrested a local fisherman after finding blood on his boat. Here in China, nine arrests have been made so far in connection with an horrific attack that was captured on security cameras at a restaurant. Uh, after a woman refused a man's advances, she was beaten, dragged by her hair outside, and savagely attacked. Now, the video went viral here before censors pulled it down. It has also ignited a debate uh, about what many social media users call, quote, an epidemic of violence against women in China. And remember when McDonald's pulled out of Russia to protest the Ukraine invasion? Well, it seems they're back, sort of. Anyway, there's no Big Macs, there's no Golden Arches, but 15 former McDonald's outlets have been rebranded and reopened. You can still get a double cheeseburger or a fish sandwich. The French fries look a little bit familiar. The new name of the Russian chain is Vokuzno and Tochka which translates roughly as tasty, and that's it. And that's it for your headlines. <laughs> All right, interesting there. Janice McIfair, thanks so much. Now, here in the U.S., the cost of living has reached another new high. Inflation is the worst it's been in decades, and gas is averaging $5 a gallon. We'll take a look at how some families are trying to make ends meet after the break. Welcome back. Record high inflation and rising gas prices have many Americans struggling to make ends meet. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow shows us how families are being forced to cut costs just to stay afloat. What's your day look like? Across the country, Americans are waking up to a new reality. When I wake up in the morning, I start worrying about bills that need to be paid. I start worrying about how I'm going to, you know, provide for my family. I worry more about what my kids are feeling more than anything. In the town of Lumberton in southeast Texas. Be with everyone in, in the country that is in need. Rising prices have forced Bridget and Johnny Lovell to drastically change their way of life. As a mom, I feel stressed about everything. They've had to cut back on the activities they enroll their three kids in. We just find more activities to do that are cheaper, free. And they've stopped eating out. The other day, my kids were talking about how they miss eating Pizza Hut because that was, for us, it's a luxury item. Good job. Instead, Bridget keeps to a tight grocery budget. If I start to see my budget going over, then I go back through my list and say, what do I absolutely have to have this week? They don't get their frozen waffles and things like that as much anymore because they cost. It's luxury items that we cut out. Are you going to race cars today? Outside Sacramento, yeah. Melissa and Mike Carr are oh, making oh, sacrifices, oh, oh, oh. too. We're giving Grant a haircut here so that we can save about $30 from this haircut. My husband gets does his own hair, and we cut our 22-year-old son hair as well. And then I was able to just find somebody to cut my hair for about $25, which is amazing for a woman's haircut. Rising prices have taken more than just a financial toll. And so I thank the Lord. We are so low on everything right now. I'm kind of dreading this grocery trip. The economy in the past two months has been um, a lot for us. It just really um, emotionally and mentally just trying to figure out um, how to make everything work. Melissa now sells old items from her home on Facebook Marketplace to make extra money. I use Facebook Marketplace probably about one to two times a week and sell several items at the same time. It's just a great way for us to save money, make some money, um, and then we can do special things like date nights or um, help us out with some bills here and there. Outside Detroit, Breeze Brown had to take on a second job delivering groceries to keep up with rising prices. Okay, so we're out pretty early doing a couple orders to make some extra money. She's also scaling back her two-year-old son's activities. My son has noticed um, that we had to make changes in the activities that we usually do. Um, you know, he's usually into 
swim, um, martial arts. I've had to cut costs just to put the necessities first. The hardest part of all of this is just having to, you know, keep going. No matter what, of course, I have to keep going. But between inflation and me, inflation's winning. <laughs> that sense of defeat perhaps felt most when filling up for gas. My feeling when pulling up to the gas station is anxiety, stress. It makes me very anxious and very stressed out. Just how much it keeps going up, especially in the last week. We've gone up uh, 50 cents just in the last week, a gallon. And we've started figuring out more ways to save, to stay on our budget. I'm okay right now, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's going high. So I'm a little bit anxious about it. This is a lot, guys. This is hard. This is really hard. The Lovell family now drives far less, combining most of their trips to use less gas. Most weeks we only leave twice a week. Breeze even switched her son's daycare to save on gas. It was just, you know, a little bit cheaper and way closer. Families making major changes to get through uncertain times. My biggest fear right now is to keep a roof over our head, gas in our car, and food on our table. My biggest fear is that things aren't gonna get better, that it's just gonna keep getting worse. I also hope that no matter what, that my family and people around us, that we can see true hope and value in the life that we do have, no matter what is going on. Our thanks to Kate Snow for that report. Now, inflation and higher gas prices are also affecting consumer sentiment, which is now at its worst level on record, dating back to the 1970s. That's because inflation is eating into every family budget, and at the moment, virtually everything Americans are buying costs more. Now, it's not just the cost of living causing people to make major lifestyle changes, it's also how they work. We'll take you to one of the fastest growing regions in the country as remote workers now choose to move to remote places. You're watching Morning News Now. This week begins a new NBC series called Priced Out in preparation for the Federal Reserve meeting to raise federal interest rates later this week. This morning, we're taking a closer look at a shift that started during the pandemic, the so-called Zoom Town boom. That's right. It's the phenomenon of small towns across America filling up with remote workers, escaping the big cities for a quieter life. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has more. Nestled among snow-capped mountains, Lisa Walters makes breakfast for five. Bye, Mom. Kids off to school, Walters to work, commuting minutes to a new co-working space to meet clients hundreds of miles away. Denver and some in San Francisco. Walters does marketing remotely from Bozeman, Montana. Her family moved from costly Oakland, California, days before COVID lockdowns forced life online. I had just so much more family time. I'm home every day at like 4.30, uh, which was unheard of. The pandemic shifted the way work is. It's shifted Bozeman too, one of the fastest growing areas across the country since the pandemic began, as Americans freed from offices began fleeing major cities in search of more space. We provide a private office and all the essentials they need. Bozeman's surge in remote work inspired Jason O'Neill to open this shared workspace. So if folks are arriving into Montana to build their own dreams, you know, really trying to become Montanans, what I think we need to be doing then at that point is saying, you know, welcome home, let's build together. We wanted to get away from the traffic mm -hmm. and the people. When the pandemic hit, all the work that I do went virtual. Therapist Bella Bukowski decamped from Seattle with her family as Bozeman's Zoom Town boom was gaining steam. I just think, oh my gosh, what an amazing place to bring up a kid. One reason, the backdrop. I mean, I think it's pretty clear the appeal this place has when you see a view like this. This is like 15, 20 miles outside of Bozeman. Also outside of Bozeman, the unprecedented pace of urban sprawl. Is the old way of life in Bozeman going away? Yeah, it is. It is? Yes, it is going away. Lifelong cattle rancher Mark Heiser isn't upset with newcomers, just the changes they bring. It has escalated quite a bit in the last two years. 
Heiser says lots of ranchers are selling to developers forced from farming by Bozeman's rising cost of living. The idea of farmers not being able to afford to keep doing what they're doing for much longer yes. feels kind of ominous. It's a little bit scary, isn't it? Where is our food coming from? In town, historic homes overshadowed by new construction. Is Bozeman overwhelmed? Well, I think um, the answer up to that is yes. Mayor Cindy Andrus says Bozeman is in a housing crisis. The median price for a single family home reaching nearly $900,000. Childcare and other costs are skyrocketing. There's a lot of money coming in with this growth. And that's that can be a good thing if that wealth is distributed equitably. But at this point, we're not really seeing that. Is this turning into a situation where people who work in Bozeman can't afford to live in Bozeman? That is a challenge for sure, yes. Then there are cultural tensions. Bose Angeles. Have you heard that nickname? Sure, I've heard all that stuff. That's silly. Will you ever call it Bose Angeles? No, I can't. It hurts my soul. <laughs> <laughs> the root, perhaps a common complaint. Traffic is doubled out here. Traffic to me is when you can't get through a stoplight in one light change. You might not get through a light immediately. <laughs> But for me, I'm like, this is not traffic. I'm not stressed. Bozeman's boom isn't slowing down. Montana native turned real estate broker Charlotte Durham sees it every day. Do you feel the intensity picking up in the housing market here? Yes. I mean, Bozeman was growing so much before the COVID pandemic, but it turned up about 10 notches. There's just not near enough inventory, unfortunately, to keep up with the amount of demand that we're seeing, which is driving prices up dramatically. Her clients, Nick and Kate Cerna, came from Cleveland in November. To them, this city still feels small. Do you think that small feeling is going to last? I do. I'm sure the landscape's going to change, but the small town is going to be a small town forever. I believe that. Believe it or not, the boom echoes on. Maggie Vespa, NBC News, Bozeman, Montana. Financial headlines now, and the market's trying to recover from one of the worst weeks of the year. Yes, the NBC senior markets correspondent Dominic Chu joins us now with more on that. Hey, Dom, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joe. Well, as Joe points out, uh, Joe points out, Wall Street could feel a lot more pressure today following Friday's hotter than expected data on consumer prices. The markets are coming off, by the way, their worst week since January. In focus this week for investors, we have reports on producer prices and that inflation level. Also, retail sales, jobless claims, and manufacturing as well. But the big event, the main event, if you will, is the Federal Reserve meeting, which begins tomorrow. The Fed is expected to increase interest rates by another half a percentage point this week at its meeting. Apple is working on several new products, including augmented reality glasses. 9 to 5 Mac, citing an analyst note, reports the glasses will be announced in the second half of 2024. Unlike Apple's upcoming mixed reality headset, these AR glasses will be highly dependent on the iPhone and may act as more of a display for the smartphone and its data. That's similar, by the way, to the first generation of Apple Watch, if you recall. And Los Angeles is the worst metro area in America for first-time home buyers. This is a new survey from Bankrate, and it says that LA ranks low in affordability, employment, safety, and tightness in the housing market. In fact, five of the 10 worst areas for first-time home buyers are in California. In addition to LA, there's Riverside, San Jose, San Francisco, and San Diego. And by the way, if you are interested in the best area in the country, it's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, mm. followed by Minneapolis, Cincinnati, Kansas City, and Buffalo, New York, guys. So those are the cities. I mean, it's tough in the real estate market right now, but mm. even way more so if you live out in California. All yeah. right. Good to know. Dom, thank you so much. Thank you. And coming up, Justin Bieber cancels shows after he reveals part of his face is paralyzed. We're going to have more on the condition he was diagnosed with and how it's treated next. Actress and singing superstar Jennifer Hudson is now part of an elite club following a big win during last night's Tony Awards. Hudson won a Tony for her producing role in the musical A Strange Loop. The win made Hudson the 17th member of the EGOT Club. Those are the mm. few people who have won an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony over the course of their careers. Other members of that club include Rita Moreno, Andrew Lloyd Webber, John Legend, and Mel Brooks. Not a bad club to be in. A Strange Loop won the top prize of Best Musical last 
last night's show recognized the musicals and plays that have opened since Broadway reopened last summer following the pandemic. And I had to go to bed early last night, so no more spoilers, please. <laughs> I was going to say, what do you think? You <laughs> seen yet. Ask me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's pretty cool, though. And it's very cool. Keep, keeping with the music theme here, international pop star Justin Bieber announced he's going to be canceling upcoming performances because of a serious and rare medical diagnosis. Yeah, that's right. Bieber shared with fans on Instagram that he's suffering from Ramsey Hunt syndrome. The singer had this to say about the virus. As you can see, this eye is not blinking. I can't smile on this side of my face. This nostril will not move. So there's full paralysis in this side of my face. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now for more on this. Hey, doctor, good morning. So, I mean, it's a pretty rare diagnosis, but walk us through what we need to know. How does somebody contract this virus? What are the symptoms? Yeah, Savannah, good morning to you and Joe. It is a pretty rare virus, a pretty rare syndrome, but not a rare virus. This is the same family of viruses that causes chickenpox, mm. and it's more commonly referred to as shingles. You, we've probably all heard of shingles. We generally think of it being common in older patients, but in this case, we have a case of shingles that attacks a specific nerve in the face, the facial nerve, which is why it causes the ear and kind of that very specific side of the face to be paralyzed. And it is about five in 100,000 people will get this particular syndrome, but of course, shingles is much more common. It can be treated if diagnosed early, which I imagine Justin Bieber had an early diagnosis. And most people make a good recovery, Savannah. But in some cases, the pain in the face or even the hearing loss, if there is hearing mm. loss, can linger. Oh. I, I want to ask you more about the treatment. I mean, what does the recovery timeline look like for him? How long will he be dealing with this for? Yeah, so the timeline can be, Joe, anywhere from weeks to months. And so this is not a day's take some medication and it's gone. It, it, it can take a while. And it just depends on the severity and how he recovers. It, in terms of like what triggered it, it's interesting with Justin, he had COVID-19 uh, in February of this year, and there has been known associations between shingles and COVID-19, particularly mm. in adults over the age of 50. What you have to assume is that Justin Bieber's schedule is so busy that the stress combined with maybe any other illness could have triggered this virus, which lays dormant in your nerves to reemerge and cause this shingles infection. So it's something that I, I think he's doing like a good public service announcement by just yeah. being very public about it and getting people to recognize when they have something going on in their body and getting medical attention. That's actually very similar to what his wife just did just a couple months ago. Justin yeah. Bieber's wife, Haley Bieber, revealed she suffered a mini stroke. It hospitalized her for days. Are you concerned about right. seeing these serious health issues in such young people? I mean, what do you make of that? Yeah, I do. I, I do. Savannah, it's, I'm a huge fan of both him and his wife. I think they brought incredible synergy together. And so, but like great couples, they've also probably had a schedule that is just not very normal. And to be honest, you don't need to be an international superstar to have yeah. stress. So I think it's a great lesson. Number one, mild cases of COVID can cause some of these things. We don't know if it's causally linked to Justin's case, but in Haley's we do. And then finally, take it easy on yourself. Knowing your body is telling mm. you to slow it down. Dr. Kavita Patel, a believer. Who knew? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, doctor. Thank you. Always great to have you. <laughs> I love her. Let's take a trip to the ballpark and a new field of dreams that is open to kids and adults of all abilities. <laughs> NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt has more on the Miracle League, where everyone is a winner. They are the sights and sounds of baseball. But on this field, the score doesn't matter. Everybody is a winner. Like third grader Miguel Londono. He is super excited. The playground, the baseball, everything. Here, they have truly leveled the playing field. I'm just going to try to hit the ball. And if the ball gets hit, I'm not going to swing it. I'm just going to drop it and just run for my life to first base. You have to wait. The Miracle League is an organization that brings the opportunity for individuals with special needs um, the chance to play baseball. Our game is modified so that every kid gets to hit and run the bases and score each inning. Every kid is paired with a buddy that helps them play the game. This week, two teams played the very first game on this new field made especially for them in Watkinsville, Georgia. Thanks to a partnership between the Miracle League and the charity Extra Special People. 
we give them dreams that they didn't even know were possible. Um, we say, yes, they can. I mean, they may be in a wheelchair, they may have autism, they may have cerebral palsy, but we say they deserve the same opportunities as every other kid. Kids and adults of all abilities can play together. Drew is never played in a sport, and so for us, it means a lot to see him doing something that his friends all do at school. Being able to see him, you know, be able to do all the different things is pretty awesome. Established in 2000, there are now more than 300 Miracle Leagues across the country. <laughs> Brings these kids out and the opportunity to be on a team and to have friends and buddies and to have the opportunity to play a sport for the first time. Differences are celebrated. I think Miracle League gives people the opportunity to really shift their perspective on what ability is. We were all created with different abilities and some of them more visible than others. For Miguel, supporting his brother is part of his game day strategy. I'm gonna help him back because brothers, brothers always help each other. You see them like be themselves and playing like they should. It really is changing lives one community at a time. And in this game, smiles are like grand slams. And miracles really do come true. We knew when we first came around the bend and everyone was cheering for our daughter that she was right where she needed to be. Good job, Slugger. Love that. Our thanks to Lester Holt for that heartwarming report. The Miracle League has locations in Puerto Rico and Canada, in addition to the U.S., and they serve more than 200,000 wow. kids and adults. Wow. That's a huge number there. I like that slugger. <laughs> yeah, so cute. Very <laughs> good. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.